data has to be wrong. Excuse me, Miss Morrow. Yes, what is it? Your partner asked me to give you this halfway through the flight. They also asked me to tell you it's time to wake up. I'm sorry, what's that supposed to mean? I have no idea. Would you like me to get you another drink? Uh, no, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. I just don't understand it. In theory, we're doing everything right, and yet... Maybe if we were to merge again... flagship office in Tokyo? Yes, that is exactly what it is. I'm sorry, who are you? My name is Entity. I'm an artificial intelligence system. I bring you a message from the future. What message? Ruth, if you don't radically change the way you do things, your bank will disappear in seven years and 120 days. I'm sorry, that can't be right. You can't be telling the truth. I have not been programmed to lie. I have been programmed to reveal the awakening of the banking industry to you. drivers of the change are always going to be commerce. Uh, you know, how do people get uh, to be able to reduce the cost base as much as they possibly can to deal with legislation, for instance, but at the same time make sure that the cost of change replatforming is not going to be prohibitive. Also, I think the other thing is that if you can show that there's a business uplift for the change. That's something that's absolutely mission critical for banks. So for example, with us as a machine learning company, it's been really essential to work out and to calculate if a bank is going to make the shift, what's the business upside going to be? What's the business case for this? There's an awful lot of talk, a lot of noise, a lot of buzzwords around technological shifts. But the thing that's essential is trying to calculate the business uplift before a bank will make any of those changes. Do traditional banks companies have the sufficient technology to face the new players? Um, probably not, is the answer. I mean, certainly for a traditional bank that's grappling with legacy systems, uh, that is a huge challenge. As I was saying earlier, there's the cost of just making a small change. Uh, just the people, the manpower cost to be able to make a change inside a bank is sometimes prohibitive to actually making the change and also prioritising. Uh, you know, it's very difficult for a traditional company to be able to move away from the here and now and today's problems and to start to think about that long-term shift that's necessary. So I think that is again an area where we try to support banks in making those uh, important decisions about what's right for the future. In the end, it's all about the client and generating confidence with the client. How is the confidence of this new era going to be built and how it is going to change their relationship with clients? Well, we're already seeing a huge shift with regard to, uh, you know, sort of robotic assistance. Um, you know, in the first instance, as humans, we're going to get used to being able to deal with uh, robots as a first line, not other humans. Um, but 
You know, I think that's something that we've already learned to embrace. I think there's more of that coming, but you know, we're already on that journey. And very often it's a better customer service than an awful, you know, it's better to talk, because consumers say they'd much prefer to speak to a, a bot who is knowledgeable than to a human that doesn't know and can't make any decisions. So I think we are at the beginning of the journey of this, uh, uh, but it's a very exciting journey and I do believe that we will completely get used to dealing with robots as our, our first line of communication with all sorts of companies. First lesson. Cash will no longer exist in the future. People will pay with their own identity. Look closely, Ruth. Tiny sensors will make it possible to look up the price of any product and update it in real time. And thanks to smart contract protocols, we will be able to fully verify the manufacturing process, preventing fraud in the supply chain. If we play our cards right, we could capture thousands of new customers. Customers are now called users. Many of these are not even human. Not human? Let me introduce you to Susan. At the moment, Susan is doing her weekly shopping. <laughs> well, she looks like she's painting a picture. When her favorite products are running out, her fridge is authorized to automatically restock them. So, are things turn into consumers? Indeed. Your cleaning robot purchases the spare parts it needs. In the future, 45% of transactions will be made by things. Well, people, things, users, as long as we can manage their accounts and budgets, everything will be fine. You don't yet see it, Ruth. There will be a total shift in paradigm. Banks will be transformed into trusted blended assistants. I'm sorry, what's that? Trust will be at the center of the banking sector. From there, different variants will be developed, such as Trust Assistant Advisors for Financial Services. Let me show you. There you have it. Banks are no longer a place where you store your savings. Banks will be artificial intelligences that assess your finances and life events. Banks will become trusted assistants. The progress made in artificial intelligence will make it possible to cross-check all consumer behavioral insights and then offer personalized consumer advice. I found a two-for-one trip to Bali. We can recommend the products Dave really needs, and our knowledge will make him truly happy. Hello, Dave. Today we have a proposal to make to you that can help you save a lot of money little by little. We have detected that you have a large number of online subscriptions that you no longer use. Do you want to talk about how to reduce them? But we can do all of this. Commit to new technologies and diversify our financial products. Look, Entity, you said my bank was going to collapse, but you were wrong. You haven't seen everything yet, Ruth.
The relation between banks and customers is going to be a combination of human and digital, but also bank-owned and third-party channels. This is happening already. When you take an Uber, pay with Santander wallet in a restaurant, or buy something in Amazon one click, for example, there is a seamless payment experience. But even in these situations, the customer is aware that he is using a Santander payment process. That will work, it is secure, and that in case of any problem can count on us to solve it. Moreover, this payment is information that we will manage carefully and with other part of the, of the customer financial information, we are providing uh, alerts, insights and advice to keep his finance on track and be financially healthy. That's the value we are bringing to help people and business proper and the channel is just the means to do it. So, banks are going to be more than places where a person can store his or her money, right? What other qualities will they have? Will we feel them as trusted assistant, uh, which helps us uh, with our goals? Will this make us interact with our transactions in more empathic or even uh, human way? Well, this is definitely the scenario we work and have tangible results already. The concept of Santander as the best open financial platform inherits or leverages an element of partnerships to bring more solutions to our users and to be relevant actor in more situations, serving more customers and needs. These solutions can be delivered through alerts, messages in your favorite app, our mobile banking, or using human-like assistance, where we already have more than a dozen of examples in production in 10 countries. So right now, banks' clients are people, but with the rise of AI and IoT, do you think that in the near future a significant percentage of clients will be things acting in behalf of humans? Well, clients are clients, and therefore humans or companies with a recognized identity, rights and obligation. Even if a robot or automatic system is initiating an operation, behind the scenes there is a customer need. In that sense, all the industry has to be prepared to an amazing increase in the number of interactions, balancing queries, payments, transfer, etc. Due to PSD2, in-app payments, aggregator, everything. And this is the scenario that our IT platforms are considering. The technology available just five years ago was not able to manage the activity we have today, and this trend will remain. Today, at exactly 14.02, a cyber threat organization carried out a major attack on one of the leading banks in Asia. Millions of exabytes with financial data are reported to have been stolen. Excuse me. News are just coming in. The malware seems to be spreading. A further 86 banks are believed to be affected. The attack is spreading all over the world. That could never happen. But it will, Ruth. The entire financial world will be put to the test on that day. But in the end, it will serve to reinforce it. Ultimately, companies will understand that cybersecurity is everything. The bank must become the definitive keeper. Look at this commercial, which came out a few months after the cyber crack. When the time comes, all your passwords are stored in a single place and protected by blockchain technology because your transactions in crypto assets deserve to be safer. So cryptocurrency does have a future then? Of course, Ruth. But when we talk about crypto assets, we are talking about much more than just cryptocurrency. There are other financial assets to consider, such as smart contracts, or crypto properties. Taking advantage of the new data management options, many companies will develop their own currency. And although the input and output will continue to be in dollars, euros or yens, most microtransactions will be in cryptocurrency. All this will affect the prices of goods and services, accounting and taxes, as well as payment systems and transactions. The revolution will be complete. But this can't be right. It's much too radical. I know the men and women in the financial world, and they'd never dare to let this happen. You are right. 
But what if your business organization were obsolete? What you are seeing here is the result of the change in legalization of PSD2, PS3, PSD4 and others. With the launch of open banking, thousands of startups, crowdfunding foundations and fintechs will finally gain access to the financial market. And nothing will be the same again. But this is what terrifies me the most. How can you defeat them, Ruth? How can you stop a torrent of creativity that has nothing to lose and everything to gain? That's the question, how? Well, if you can't beat them, join them. Open banking will involve the transformation of most of the world's banks. If you want yours to survive, you must become a factory of digital assets. So we can help facilitate the innovation. Banks will become more open and flexible structures. Through these horizontal organizations, the most brilliant minds in the world will unite to develop and improve stock market services and applications. It makes complete sense, Entity. If we could leverage all of this energy and make the shift work in our favor, I think we can help make this happen. I know what I need to do. Then, my mission is done. Good luck saving your company. Okay, I think I know what I need to do. I need to arrange a meeting straight away. Hello, Ruth. Welcome to the present. So we found that there's many challenges across financial services banking. Um, it's really being led by the increased complexity for the banks, uh, the increased demands from the customers. And what it's resulting in is banks, financial institutions are looking at ways to become more of a platform, a platform to reach new customers, to get deeper with their existing customers. Uh, and I think from the customer side, they're expecting these connections to be there um, as, uh, as they experience uh, their financial life outside of just in banking, they're expecting it from their financial providers. Blockchain and DLT have been the main technology game changers in the recent years. Can you briefly explain uh, your company long-term strategy within the financial sector? When we started R3, we began the company in a lot of ways backwards. We started with our customers first and then try to assess what's the right product fit for them. And one of the big requirements that we saw was the ability to connect participants and the ability to get in sync with uh, a set of shared facts, but doing it in a way where you still enable privacy. If you look at the regulatory backdrop of today, it will only increase in the future. And we are firm believers that everyone should be in charge of their own data, whether you're an individual or an institution. And we think that um, DLT, blockchain technology, has an immense role to play in that. Uh, whether it's digital identity or whether it's the aspects of, uh, of a portfolio that customers, banks, participants need to have, need to be in control of their own data, that's when the peer-to-peer -peer nature of Corda is extremely powerful, be able to ha uh, deliver on the promise of what I see is what you see. Regulation plays a big part in the banking industry. How do you see central banks' stance towards DLT? How can GDPR detriment the power of blockchain and DLT? R3 has spent a tremendous amount of time with regulators and central banks over the last four to five years. And interestingly, with this technology innovation, central banks and regulators are embracing the technology. They view this as a tool to help them do their jobs better. Now, that has to be coupled with uh, aspects of GDPR and privacy, where you have to be able to figure out 
how can you have the benefits of blockchain technology, which is sharing data, but also have the privacy and the security that regulators will need? Because as we all know, regulators take, uh, are very open to innovation as long as it reduces risks. And in our conversations with the regulatory community, they're looking at blockchain technology as a tool to increase the amount of oversight they have in markets while reducing risk for their economies or for the markets that they regulate.